Welcome back, everybody. This is your Feel Good Breakfast Show here on S3. Welcome to Thursday. Now, last week's mass shooting massacre in Texas was yet another grim reminder that in the US, where civilians own nearly 400 million firearms, children are more likely to die from gun violence than in any other high-income country. And yet at home, we aren't much safer either, as South Africa crime statistics show that 16 people are shot and killed every single day. That's just about under 6,000 people a year. What is at the root of of this pandemic are the is it the guns or are the troubled minds of those who pull the trigger? Those are the questions we are asking today. And today's discussion is on gun violence and it features a panel consisting of broadcast journalist Nick Anderson as well as media practitioner Nash Mikado as well as counsellor Melissa Smith. We are encouraging every one of you at home right now to join in on the discussion and please do send through your voice notes to our WhatsApp line. It is 063-408-8863. Thank you guys so much for joining us for this very important conversation this morning yeah it's uh this is gonna be a good conversation so i want to dive straight into it we've got three parts but yet i think there's a lot to cover here and there's a lot going on not only in our country but around the world right nick you're someone that's literally been covering some foreign affairs and seeing some of these issues that have been taking place i mean there's catastrophes in buffalo south carolina and uh, uvalde or valda how you pronounce that what is your take on what's happening now man in America, it's, it's tragic because it doesn't take those of us working in the media to know that this is a complete regular yeah. occurrence. Yeah. I mean, it's been going on for years. I mean, I'm 27 years old. It's been going on my whole life. It's been going on for years before that. And the situation in America, like you mentioned, there's so many guns and the country is quite divided on how to handle the saga. Mm. So it recurs. I think if you look at, we looked at, there's been 17 school shootings so far this year. Yeah. If you go off mass shootings, which is more than four people killed in America, we're already over 200 so far this year. Is that the current statistic? So it's a huge, wow, huge scary. gun crisis there. And that's why, like, it's a, ro a rolling door in the media. It's just from wow. shooting to shooting, from shoot to shooting. And it's, where does the solution come? Yeah. That is, that is so crazy to think about that. And let's bring it home as well, because I was saying 6,000 people a year in South Africa alone. That is scary. I mean, Melissa, your take on this, you know, where does this stem from? Coming from, is this coming from a place of trauma, a place of fear? What is your take on this? And it's such a good question to ask because I think sometimes we don't look at where it's coming from. We just look at the person who's doing it and just the action. And a lot of, of my experience when it comes to trauma is that people um, or the perpetrators usually, um, there's two main factors um, that, that stood out. And it's sometimes children come from an impoverished background and they feel like they don't belong and they don't have the resources. So it's that sense of belonging. And unfortunately, um, at times, gangs produce that. You know, that father figure, that sense of belonging. We're also in a very fatherless generation. Mm. And so they seek, they seek that attention and they want that um, father figure. Also, sometimes in, in a school environment, they have a learning barrier. And sometimes our classes are so crowded and the teacher doesn't have that opportunity to even just focus on that child or the parent is not equipped to know that the child has a learning barrier. And so what happens, the child feels out, they get bullied and picked on and then they don't want to be at school no more. And they go to the streets and they find that in the streets. So it's definitely rooted into the childhood. I, I love what you're saying because, I mean, it does fit into the narrative of many humans just wanting to fit in, yeah. wanting to belong. And now you have this divide where it almost presents anger if you don't or this frustration yes. when you're not. I love how you're saying that, Melissa. Nash, maybe I can put it to you. You're a specialist yeah. when it comes to content creation, right? And I'm obviously assuming that you spend a lot of time online seeing yes. what the current trends are, what's happening in the world. Do you see any sort of patterns in this new culture that's being adopted online, which kind of adds or breeds to this mm. narrative of like, express your anger, go out there and do something crazy, like pick up a gun. Is that bre being bred on the online scene as well? Or is it something a bit more convoluted than that? Well, firstly, thanks very much for the opportunity to speak on uh, such a pressing yeah. issue. We see gun violence manifest itself the world over in uh, different ways. Yeah. Here in South Africa, we see it as vendetta-related violence, as in the case of the Guguletu massacre and Kaili Chetavan shootings mm. of 2020, right? Um, in an American context, the internet has been labeled as a repository for um, these extremist ideologies way back since the Columbine school shootings of 1999, okay. right? People have been saying that, uh, the internet, but back then, the internet had only been available for about six years yeah. for the public. So it was all speculation, right? But the recent 
Columbine, um, I mean, the recent uh, Buffalo shooting has removed all doubt because the Buffalo shooter, he wrote a 180 page document that he then uploaded online, right? And in that document, there's a part where he answers the question, where do you get your present beliefs from? And he said, mostly the internet, blatantly say that. And then he goes on to reinforce that idea yeah. by saying that I did not get my present beliefs from anyone I met in person. So yes, I do think that the internet does facilitate the intent to kill. Oh, wow, that is, that is yeah. even opening another topic right now, you know, what the internet is now impacting on this discussion. But how do we change this narrative? Because I mean, guns are not the problem. It's also the mental health of these people that's the problem, especially in our young men in these exactly. countries. So Melissa, how do we address this in schools and in homes? I think in schools, normalizing, you know, with young men to express their emotions. This notion of boys don't cry. You know, that's still prevalent within our communities and even in our in our schools, having kids, giving kids the opportunity to regulate the emotions. I don't think there's enough emphasis within our school systems when it comes to regulating your emotions and being able to express your emotions. I think as a parent also it's very important to um, allow the kids to express their emotions and make it known that you can cry if something happens to you. You know, you can feel sad, you're allowed to feel angry, but how you deal with it is very important. And sometimes we make kids feel that um, feeling angry is wrong or feeling sad is bad and it's only for girls and it's not for boys. And when we do that, we take away from, from the expression, we limit them. We allow them to suppress their emotions. And when you suppress your emotions, it affects you later on in life. So when you speak to a young adult, you always have to go back to their childhood because that's where it started. I love this. And I love the fact that what's making me understand more about part of this issue, right, is, and, and, and Nick, I want to get back to you about the stats in terms of this because it's quite important, but just something that you mentioned earlier, Nash, it almost seems to me as if the guidance is lacking when it comes to our youth. I mean, I resonate so much with what you're saying when it comes to not expressing your emotion. I come from the world of suck it up, eat concrete, yeah. and get on with it. What happens when you can't deal with your emotion? How do you express it? And I find that this is a situation that we can be put in. So it almost seems like there's this lack of guidance. When I look at what, what you guys are mentioning, it seems as though there is that lack of like a father figure or someone saying to you, it's okay to express your emotion, like you mentioned. It's okay to hang out with certain people that you do or don't want to. I, mm -hmm. I, I love that narrative, but how do we kind of solve that? Because like you said, yes, the internet is this breeding ground. It has so much information positive and negative, it's more about how we subscribe to that. So how do we then kind of tailor the decision of the youth to subscribe to the positivity that is out there? Because look, in this world that we live in, we can't deny the fact that there's evil and good everywhere. Mm. It's about those decisions we make. How do we, how do we get those decisions to be the correct ones? Maybe this is a, a question for everybody right now. <laughs> I, I don't know, I'm asking, you know? I don't know, anyone want to pick that one up? <laughs> I think it's, it depends on, and it's quite different, and obviously we'll chat more about this later, but the, the solution for South Africa and the solution for the US, I mean, look at the crime we have here, but do we see shootings to that level that we see in the US here in our own country? And we have to ask ourselves why to that. So that's what makes me believe that the solution is going to be very different in the mm. US where we know, and obviously it's something we'll mention in terms of just how the gun culture there is so different to here. Yeah. Here we know we have guns, but it's literally a right to bear arms there. And that is viewed as an equivalent to every other right there, where most other countries don't view guns yeah. quite as strong. Yeah. Mm. For gun violence or not for gun violence? That is the question, but the conversation is only just getting started here on your Feel Good Breakfast Show. So please do stay tuned as we discuss ways we can mitigate gun violence for good. We're also, again, encouraging every single one of you at home to join in on this discussion and send through your voice notes if you have any questions for the panel. That WhatsApp number is 063-408-8863. We'd love to hear from you. It's my Feel Good Breakfast Show. Welcome back. We're still live here on your Feel Good Breakfast show and we are back to our discussion about mass shooting and gun violence that we have seen on our news headlines uh, over the past couple of weeks. Now, earlier on, we explored the possible root causes of such avoidable tragedies and now our panel is back to explore how the rate of gun violence can be curtailed, not only in the United States, but here in our own country too. And again, we are encouraging every single one of you to join in on this discussion and send through your voice notes to our WhatsApp line. It is 063 408 Double eight six three. That being said, we have our first caller yeah. or our first voice note, and that is from Chris from Durban, um, and he had this to say. Uh, hi guys, uh, I'm against guns for the reason that I feel a lot of uh, 
psychologically unfit people are walking around legally uh, in the possession of guns and they act on impulse at the wrong time uh, they forget the rules they under the influence of drugs of alcohol <coughs> and that's why people lose their lives i think it should strictly be uh, the army or the police possessing guns even though the criminals have a lot of <coughs> access to it and i think uh, that would help mm, i like that and maybe a great point melissa maybe you can talk about the psychology behind this is it definitely an issue when you have something at your disposal that's going to amplify our, our, our desire to express, let's just say that. And are we a fickle enough nation to not sometimes have control of that emotion and just act out on it? What do you think? I, I definitely think that because at the end of the day, a gun is not like an instrument, you know, like if you play guitar, you know, it's the person behind the guitar, not the guitar. Yeah. It's not the same instance of the gun. I think definitely, yes, it is the person behind the gun, but it is that gun um, like he said, uh, we, as a, our human nature is to express. And if that's the only way that we can express, then people will use the gun. Yeah. So I think it's definitely, it's not to say that it's the gun as an instrument, but it's, it's the person, but it's also that gun as well. Mm. So that is also a form of expression, a very bad form of expression, but it is a form of expression. And unfortunately, we can't change that. Mm. Definitely. Uh, we do have another uh, voice note through from Mervyn. Uh, he had this to say. Hi, good morning, Expresso team. My name is Marvin Frolic, and I'm against guns. Okay. Oh, okay, so short and sweet, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. So just for, short and sweet. Yeah. Uh, another one also coming through for Angel from Pretoria. Good morning, Expresso show. I'm Angel, and I'm from Pretoria. I'm also a school learner. But the question that I would like to ask is how do people? or how do learners end up getting in with such dangerous weapons at school while there are security guards? What is their job? Aren't they supposed to look after the school property? How can they let people get in with this type of weapons? Nick, you are nodding your head like, oh my word, yes, this is a question yeah. we are asking. Because everyone's asking this, where are the kids getting these guns? So maybe you and can answer this. how are they this. getting to the schools with it? Where's the access control? Where's the safety exactly. protocols? And yeah. I'm going to take it back to America again, because the shooting in Uvalde, that specific school had done in the last few weeks, it's come out now, they had done prep with the SWAT team, they had done new security protocols of police going in and learning the layout of the schools. But as we know from that case, police actually took their time and the police chief has apologized for not handling the situation correctly. Oh, wow. So again, we're seeing the US now ramping up. The Texas governor has said, right, we are now going to dial up security measures even more. But the problem is, was, like we know, it is a mental health problem too. But in America, where there's so many, this obsession with guns more than other nations, the two go together and it yeah. creates this catastrophic situation which we keep seeing. Maybe I want to touch on that because I'm just reading something here about the NRNA and many conservative bodies. They all believe that the only thing that stops a bad guy with a gun is a good guy with a gun. And I mean, the opinion on the US Second Amendment, which gives you almost a right to bear arms, mm. kind of adding fuel to this fire, I'd imagine, right, Nick? It's, it's complete fuel to the fire. And like we said, and it sounds almost strange, like a right to bear arms, and you said almost right. In America, it's full on. And if you say, right, we want to do background checks, right, we want to do, um, say, if you're having mental health issues, it's a bit more difficult to get a gun. Because remember, in many parts of America, it's easier to get a gun than it is to buy you alcohol. You can go into like a bank and get a gun. I believe, you can yeah? get <laughs> guns like it's pick and pay or something yeah. easily here. So it's a really a complicated issue. And that's why we're seeing now that right and that fixation and the country is divided in terms of the US on how to handle this. Mm. Half the country's like, right, let's take away the guns. But then the other, uh, maybe 30 or so percent, but it's such a strong vocal 30 percent, they are right, right, if you touch your guns, you are infringing on my right. So even if I'm having a rough time, I should still be able to buy a gun easily. And we say, right, make that a bit more difficult. And then people immediately say, right, you are infringing on my rights. And that's why nothing gets done in terms of changing the law. Mm. Mm. Nick, I want to bring you in on this because you, uh, Nash, sorry, you had something very uh, profound to say online. You said, you know, something is causing young men to become radicalized to the point of becoming bloodthirsty monsters, or more precisely put, domestic terrorists. Okay, that is yes. what you said online. Yeah. What do you think that something is? Well, I think it's a host of sociopolitical, economic, and cultural factors leading to radicalization, right? There's something in Hegelian philosophy uh, called the rubble. So according to Hegel, 
the rabble are basically people who have been forced to the peripherals of this organized social space where there's harmony and peace. So they're called to participate in this harmony, but at the same time, simultaneously, they are deprived of the means to do so. So these people feel like their only way to express discontent is through irrational acts of destructive violence. Now, how does this relate to gun violence and mass shootings as a whole? If we take, for instance, the Uvalde shooter, we see bullying was used as a tool for exclusion. You know, there's one account that says that he was um, teased by other kids. He was called a school shooter prior to the shooting based on how he looked and best based on how he dressed. So there's an ideological side of radicalization that instills the intent to kill through extremist ideologies like the replacement theory and general social conditioning that shapes the mind of an individual and convinces them beyond doubt that they are justified in committing these horrible acts mm. of terror against society. In America, however, like what Nick was saying, I do believe that the ubiquity of guns is a major problem because now when you have so many guns in a country where the number of guns in, in, in circulation outnumber the population, um, it's easier for the radicalized to then act out their psychological and ideological inclinations. So yes, I, I think it's like a host of factors, but the presence of guns in society does play a central role in having these uh, uh, kinds of crimes perpetrated. Oh, I love the point you're making there, and it sounds so interesting because it's like this constant chipping away at someone's character, that narrative constantly changes as they're going through the environment, and that externality has a big effect on, added to the fact that you have the possibility of having a gun there. That's a bad recipe. I love how you put that together. And what a panel we have this morning, Mzanzi. Thank you so much for joining us. Of course, this conversation is not going anywhere. We are going to be carrying on with this and, again, talking to all these incredible individuals on the couch about all when it comes to gun violence and protecting our kids. And thank you again for sending those incredible voice notes in. Keep bringing them on because we're going to continue to divulge and discuss more of it.